if there is a God, a God of love and justice, would he really send people to a place of conscious, everlasting torment? Welcome to the Proximity Portal channel and all things reconciled with Avi Penhalo, a live stream broadcast where we'll delve into the depths of faith, seeking to draw nearer to the divine and to each other. It's a tough question, one that's stirred debates and divided opinions for centuries. Now, to be honest, I personally do not think about it that much anymore. My own beliefs have evolved from the idea of eternal punishment a long time ago, but even though my heart has been settled on the issue for over 20 years, I still find myself talking about it because it's nearly impossible to talk about spirituality and faith in our culture without addressing heaven, hell, and what people think about them. Now, I was born and raised in the evangelical religion. Now, I intentionally use the word religion to remind my Bible-believing or saved evangelical friends that yes, they are part of a religion. And they will often object to this by saying they are not religious, rather they have a relationship with Jesus. They don't see this distinction as mere semantics, so I like to be that little thorn in their side, reminding them that they indeed have a doctrine, they have dogmatics, and they have interpretive imperatives. So their faith is a faith conditioned by rules and regulations that they didn't come up with. And these rules have a tremendous effect on defining this relationship they have with Jesus. Now, I'm not being hard on these believers. I'm just reflecting the reality outside their respective worldview. And this makes them uncomfortable, sometimes even angry. To this, I say, the shoe fits, because once you step outside their very small worldview, it becomes very obvious that these same people have been making others feel uncomfortable for centuries. So as someone who emerged out of this thinking into a much more expansive view of the Bible, of Christ, and of reality itself, I feel a moral responsibility to relieve the world of their harassment. Now, I am not saying that all evangelicals behave in this chauvinistic and belligerent way. But I think most of you know what I'm talking about. And I have to say that even the most soft-spoken, bless your heart, Christians are not exempt from the effects of doctrines that inevitably carry a message of exclusion and separation. Even the most hip and liberal evangelicals soft pedal a gospel that fosters alienation and marginalization. Just because they do so with a gentle voice and in casual torn jeans and kicks and flannel shirts doesn't mean that the message isn't the same as their forebears. So let's just put that on the table right away. Now the rest of this broadcast will be taking a look at another view. Universal reconciliation or the salvation of all. It's the understanding that in the end, God will restore all things. Now we'll unpack what this means, and then I will share with you what my late Archbishop Ash believed and taught in his own church. And the answer might surprise you, regardless of your position on universal salvation or heaven and hell. I can see some people hearing this and crying heresy, or that's not biblical. And if that's you, I completely understand. But I also invite you to at least hear the full argument presented here. All of us need to think through this because it directly affects our faith and it affects the way we live our lives. We also need to reflect more deeply on what the Bible says and doesn't say about this. So I'll just I'll throw one out there to start. Colossians 1 verses 19 through 20 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now we can dig into some more scripture later, and I'll put some up on the screen for you. But now... Let's think about this notion that only a certain kind of Christian is saved. So let's start with a snapshot of our world today. Right now, there are about 8 billion humans living on our planet. Most of us do not really grasp how large of a number that is. 
So let me remind you of the difference between $1 and $100, $1,000 and $100,000 and a million. That jump is enormous. And I want you to keep this in mind. I want you to think about the difference between 1 million and 2 million. That's not a small increase. It's just doubled. But when we jump from 2 million to a billion, it's hard for most of our minds to grasp. Why? Because most of us have never experienced a close proximity to that sum. Most of us have never touched anything close to that amount of wealth. We might be able to have an abstract conceptual understanding of it, but we do not truly grasp it. So I just said that right now there are 8 billion people breathing the same air right now on this earth. 8 billion souls. I don't care how many followers you have on social media. I know it's nothing close to that number. What does this have to do with anything? Well, if you are one that believes that only a certain kind of Christian will be saved, it presents us with a horrifying view of the world. So my friends, we have the data. So currently, out of 8 million souls on the planet, there are only about 660 million people on Earth who would be identified as born-again Christians. 660 million Bible-believing Christians. And that's assuming that they're all true to their beliefs. Do the math. This means that according to them, about 91.75% of humans on Earth today are going to be punished forever in hell. Now, they usually don't say this part out loud, of course, but I invite anyone to show me otherwise. But this gets even more mind-boggling. If we zoom out and consider all of human history, we're talking about a ballpark figure of about 108 billion people who've ever walked the earth. And if we're sticking to this narrow ticket to salvation, well then, we're scraping at less than 1% of humanity throughout the ages who'd be considered saved. That is a lot of folks left out in the cold over the millennia, or should I say, the outer darkness, sizzling in the lake of fire in conscious torment forever. These are your mothers, your brothers, your sisters, aunts, uncles, and the majority of all your relations. So what does this say about the God of love and justice? Are we missing a piece of the puzzle here? Or maybe, just maybe, is this understanding of God and salvation a tad bit too narrow? To use a contemporary language, it doesn't sound so victorious now, does it? Now, there are different views about what eternal punishment looks like, so I want to be fair to my evangelical and charismatic brothers and sisters. Some of their theologians will tell us that the unsaved will not burn forever. Rather, their suffering will come to an end and they will cease to exist. Their souls snuffed out by God's mercy. This is called the annihilationist view. And to be fair, it's not just some Protestants who adhere to it. Annihilationism can be found also in the Roman Catholic and in Eastern Orthodox circles. So regardless, this view is not incredibly common in the popular imagination or the eternal hell vision is the most prevalent. Even for those who don't believe in God, it's at least what they think people who believe in God believe. So on top of this grotesque view, this it's a grotesque view of God's love. We're faced with the fact that most people, the issue of what the church teaches about heaven and hell has long been settled. And people just assume that the church has always believed this grim picture, both believers and non-believers alike. Now, what are your beliefs about this? Is it true for you that the church has always held to this narrow view about who will be saved? And some of you, for some of you, uh, this might be the very reason that you left church completely. And for others, it's the very reason that you stayed. Although this seems to be more like a hostage situation than a free will loving relationship with Jesus. Either way, 
I want you to take some time with me and think through these things. I'm going to share with you the idea that the dominant view about eternal damnation may not have been the view of Jesus or his disciples and the early church. Furthermore, I hope to show you that throughout the past 2000 years, this issue was far from settled. So I hope to unsettle our notions that we just assumed were true all along. Now, before we do that, let's do a quick recap of the past uh, few weeks. We've been taking a deeper look into the legacy and prophetic preaching of Archbishop Ferran Ash, paying particular attention to one of his most popular sermons, There's Got to Be More. Now, although we've covered a lot of ground, there's still much more to understanding his teachings, especially those related to his relationship with Eastern Orthodoxy. But the truth is that we cannot fully grasp these ideas without spending much more time learning about the differences between the Christian East and West. We also need to learn the history of the early church and how the first Christians viewed the world, the Bible, and salvation. Now, what I hope is that these sessions have made you curious to learn about all of these things. And this is my hope because it was also Varan Ash's hope. He longed for you to know where his dynamic and prophetic preaching was coming from. Yes, you, you can argue that it was his anointing, but he would be the first to tell you that he did not invent most of the revelatory parts of his messages. And we have seen how Archbishop Ash stood on the shoulders of 2,000 years of ancient apostolic teachings. He was an expert at biblical interpretation, but he was also an avid reader of patristics, which is all the other early Christian writings that many of us are barely aware of. Baron Ash was not just a reader of these documents. He sought out mentors from the Orthodox tradition, those who have guarded these teachings for two millennia. And under their guidance, Varan Ash immersed himself in the spiritual practices that go hand in hand with the ancient teachings of the church. Varan Ash did not just look at these things. He internalized them. He brought himself and his congregations into the Eastern apostolic faith. And that's not an easy task. But in many ways, Archbishop Ash was a forerunner for many seekers to come. It's important for me to mention all of this because we are not just having a discussion about theological debates. When I set out to do this series, it was with the intention to clear up many things about Archbishop Ash that I've seen distorted over the years. Now, as I've said earlier, this is not about me. Sure. I'm going to give you plenty of my own thoughts about all these things, but I do make the promise to you that it will not put words into Varan's mouth. Varan and I agreed on many things, but certainly not everything. What we agreed on certainly outweighs the disagreements, and what we agreed upon will be our focus here. Now, in recent weeks, we've touched on how Archbishop Ash viewed the Christian spiritual journey. So, Salvation is not just a one and done and get your ticket punched to heaven stamped by the blood of Jesus. We're called to something much greater than merely having all the bad things we've done forgiven. This is pretty much the starting point for a life in Christ, but it is far from the destination. And by destination, I'm not talking about jumping from our mediocre lives here on earth into heaven when we die. The ancient church of the East teaches the same thing that St. Paul did, that all of us need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He didn't say we're saved by our works, but he is clearly not using the Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven bumper sticker nonsense either. Salvation is about transformation. It's not about being saved from anything. Rather, the Orthodox say it's about say, being saved to, saved to become one with God. Or as it says in the book of Second Peter, God has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate 
in the divine nature. So much so that our very being is full and filled with the fullness and the energies of God, no matter how you slice it. This means that salvation, as we experience it, is a process. We were saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. And I have to keep mentioning this because it is very foreign to the modern Western Christian experience. I also have to keep saying that this transformation is completely done by and through the grace of God. It is not our works that saves us. It's our cooperation with God's energies and grace to bring us to the higher realms of faith. This is theosis, and this is the teaching of Orthodox Christianity. Theosis is a revelation for many of us in the West, but I can tell you that theosis is also a revelation to many of those in the Orthodox Church. I've met several Orthodox Christians who were born into the faith and have never even heard about this transformation. That's a topic for me to take up with my Orthodox friends, but I simply need you to know that Archbishop Ash believed in theosis. He saw this as the holy of holies in Christianity. If you missed the earlier videos in this series and you want to know more about it, I'll post the links in the description. So just as Varan Ash shared that there are many realms of faith, some faith remains at the surface level, what he called the outer court or the 60-fold, or the, uh, or I'm sorry, when the faith goes further into the 60-fold, or inner court realm, um, that's another level of faith. But Ash emphatically declared that all followers of the path of Christ are called to the 100-fold or the Holy of Holy realms. Here he again was speaking about theosis, or as the early church father St. Athanasius put it, God became man so that man could become God. <clears throat> now, in our minister, years of ministry together, Varan Ash and I talked about these ideas of hell, eternal damnation, heaven, and we talked about universal salvation. I remember Archbishop Ash gave me a copy of a book by Callisto Ware, well-known author and Orthodox bishop. It was called The Inner Kingdom, Volume 1. And in it, there was a chapter Varan was particularly interested in discussing with us. That chapter was called, Dare We Hope for the Salvation of All. Now, if you want to skip the rest of this video and go buy the book and read that chapter, you could do that. Because Varan Ash told me that this chapter summed up his official position on universal salvation. So the Greek word used for this reconciliation of all things is called apokatastasis. <laughs> Not only is this a, a scary idea for some, it also doesn't quite roll off the tongue. So we could say, I used to say apokatastasis, apokatastasis, uh, let's say uh, apokatastasis, um, but you'll probably hear me say it more often as apokatastasis, which is probably incorrect. Anyway, it's the Greek term that essentially means restoration or reconstitution of something to its original or proper state. But remember what Bishop Ash said. Reconciliation is not getting back what you lost. It's getting back more than you lost. He said that in Adam, we lost a garden of paradise. But in Christ, we get the whole cosmos. We get back more than just our primal innocence and our victory over death. We gain eternal life and we gain the fullness of the knowledge of God. That is theosis. Apocatastasis goes beyond our individual salvation and it hints at the salvation of the entire cosmos. This means all beings, where every creature, every star, every grain of sand, plays its part. Now, holiness apostolic folks like to quote Acts 2.38, but they often ignore Acts 3.21, where Peter, speaking about Jesus, says, 
heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore apocatastasis everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Now here, restore everything gets at the heart of apocatastasis. This idea that there's going to be a grand cosmic restoration where all things are made right. Getting back much more than we lost. Now, Ash invites us into this grand vision where salvation just isn't about getting our personal spiritual passport stamped. It's about participating in a divine restoration project that's as wide as the universe itself. This idea turns the table on some of our more narrow views. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's about a God whose saving embrace is looking to gather up the entire cosmos. It's a call to see beyond our own story, to see our place in a narrative that's as vast as creation itself. Ash's conviction challenges us to widen our spiritual horizons, to embrace a salvation that's not just about escaping punishment or securing a place in the afterlife, but about entering into a heart of God whose love knows no bounds, whose mercy is as infinite as the galaxies. So what do you think? How does this change the way that we see our faith? How does it change the way we see our world and our role within it? Ash's vision invites us to be a part of something bigger, of something cosmic. It's a call to live out our faith with a sense of awe and wonder at the vastness of God's saving work. If we're talking about a plan that encompasses all of creation, then suddenly our lives, our interactions with each other, and our relationship with the environment take on a new meaning. Archbishop Ash's vision invites us to see every act of kindness, every effort to heal our planet, every moment of genuine connection as a part of this grand divine narrative of restoration. It's as if each choice we make is a brushstroke on the vast canvas of God's redemptive plan. We're all contributing to a masterpiece that's continually unfolding. Embracing this vision requires a shift, and not just in our theology, but in our very way of being. It asks us to move from the mindset of exclusivity to one of radical inclusivity, where the well-being of our neighbor, the health of our planet, and the integrity of our communities are seen as integral to our own. It's more than just the journey of our own salvation. And I hate to say it, but this is exactly what is lacking in most of our infernalist hell-preaching churches. This is because their theology lacks a depth we're pointing at here. Baran Ash says in his message, there's got to be more, that the summation of our theology has been ethics and morals instead of the fullness of the gospel. And sadly, what modern Christians call the world often gets this much better than we do. So this isn't about diluting our faith or losing our distinctiveness of our Christian identity. Rather, it's about deepening our understanding of what it means to follow a God whose love knows no limits, whose grace is as boundless as the universe. It's about living out our faith with a profound awareness of our interconnectedness with all of creation. Now, in a minute, we'll talk about a little bit more about the scriptures that, that support this understanding of salvation and apocatastasis. But as we reflect on this, let's ask ourselves, how does this broader vision of salvation challenge us to live differently? How does it reshape our priorities, our values, or the way that we engage with the world around us? Archbishop Ash's insights invite us into a journey of transformation, one that extends far beyond the confines of our personal spiritual experiences to embrace a holistic vision of redemption 
This is a journey that calls us to be agents of reconciliation, bearers of hope, playing our part in this divine symphony of salvation that encompasses all things. Salvation is not just a future promise, but a present reality. It's dynamically unfolding in and through us. This view challenges us to engage with our faith, not as passive recipients, waiting for a redemption, but as active participants in God's ongoing work of restoration. Just think about the beauty and complex of this world around us. Think about it. The intricate dance of ecosystems, the rich diversity of human cultures, and the mysterious expanse of the universe. All of this is not just mere backdrops to our personal salvation narratives. These are integral parts of the divine masterpiece, lovingly woven together by a God whose creativity knows no bounds. This holistic understanding of salvation invites us to live each day with a sense of sacred purpose, recognizing that our every action from washing dishes to winning a position in political office plays a role in the unfolding story of the divine. It's a call. It's, it's to view our care for the environment, our pursuit of justice, our acts of compassion, not as optional extras, but as essential expressions of our faith. And I would say of our transformation. So we think of our salvation and we think of transformation and a lot of times we're just thinking about ourselves it's not about just ourselves you know it's another way to look at the verse you know jesus is either lord of all or he's not not verse but saying he's either lord of all or not lord at all well i agree with that statement and so if we believe that the creator is the lord of all then we should be concerned with all and in this light salvation becomes a journey of co-creation with God, where we're invited to contribute our unique gifts and talents to the healing and flourishing of this world. It's a vision that empowers us to live with hope and purpose, even in the face of challenges and uncertainties, because we know that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. Isn't this a much better good news? A gospel that deepens our understanding of our role in God's redemptive plan to inspire us to act with greater love, with greater courage, with greater creativity. How might this transform the way that we view our responsibilities to one another and to the planet? This is an entirely different spiritual life than just being saved in our minds. Embracing this vision of salvation as a cosmic participatory reality offers us a path to a deeper, more engaged faith, one that sees every aspect imbued with the divine significance, all parts of our life and every moment as an opportunity to live out the values of the kingdom of God, the proximity, the kingdom of heaven is at hand among us proximity portal. That's simply what it's pointing to. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the manifested proximity. Salvation is no longer about us versus them or the saved and the unsaved. It's a narrative that encompasses every life, every story, whether triumph or tragedy, and it weaves it into a tapestry of redemption that transcends our often limited perspectives. This perspective, it challenges us to look beyond the boundaries we've drawn around our faith to see the image of God reflected in the faces we might have overlooked or dismissed. It calls us to recognize the divine spark in all of creation, urging us toward a posture of humility and openness, where we're willing to learn from and engage with the vast diversity of God's world. But what does this look like in practice? It means 
our spirituality can no longer be confined to our Sunday services or even our personal devotions. It spills out into the streets. It spills out into the workplaces, into our communities, and even into the ways that we interact with the natural world. It transforms our faith into a living, breathing reality that permeates every aspect of our existence. Now, as, as an Orthodox, I might add that it does also transform the way that we worship. The entire divine liturgy is a reenactment of this cosmic redemption. Archbishop Ash wanted you to know this. He wanted you to experience this. If you came to his church, you would have seen it. Uh, shouts of praise re uh, reverberated at a level so profound, yet at the same time, his deep voice would chant the great prayer of the Trisagion. Kadishat Allaho Kadishat Holy art thou almighty, and holy art thou immortal one, have mercy on us. As we ponder the implications of this cosmic vision of salvation, let's challenge ourselves. Let's challenge ourselves with a few questions. How does this shift our understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ in the world today? How might this vision inspire us to reimagine our roles within our communities and in the broader creation. This envision, this, this entire vision, invites us to step into a broader, more inclusive understanding of our faith. One that sees salvation as a dynamic, ongoing process of renewal and restoration that touches every aspect of the created order. It challenges us to move beyond the narrowly defined transactional view of salvation and embrace a more relational participatory role in the divine narrative. And I might add, this is what it truly means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we don't have this vision, this larger vision of who God is and who we are in God, we will miss we will miss the vision and we will miss our role. And in, and in effect, you will miss a relationship with Jesus. Which Jesus are we talking about? So, but I want to be clear though, that embracing this vision requires more than an intellectual assent. It demands a radical openness to transformation, both personally and communally. It calls us to examine the ways in which our beliefs and practices affect and reflect or fail to reflect the inclusive restorative heart of God. It invites us to consider how our lives and our communities might look different if we truly lived as if all creation was beloved of God and truly believed that all of creation is included in the divine plan for redemption. This isn't just about tweaking our theology. It's about reimagining what it means to live as people of faith in a world that is groaning for redemption. It's about asking ourselves, how can we be agents of reconciliation and healing in a world that is fractured by division, injustice, 
and an environmental degradation. So as we contemplate the vastness of Archbishop Ash's vision, let's ask ourselves, let's ask ourselves some of these challenging questions. How might this understanding of salvation change the way we relate to those who, for example, hold different beliefs? How does it shape our response to the pressing social and environmental issues of our day? And how does it inspire us to live out our faith in ways that contribute to the healing and wholeness of the world? When we embrace the fullness of salvation, we are invited to a life of deeper compassion. We're invited to broader empathy. We're invited to more active engagement with the needs, the actual needs of the world. And it's a journey that, that's going to stretch us. It's going to challenge us. And, but ultimately, it's going to transform us. As we become not just believers in a doctrine, hear me, but participants in God's grand work of making all things new. Remember, everything we accomplish here, though, is by divine grace. I always have to say that because I grew up, you know, as a Protestant, and it was the whole grace versus works dichotomy, dualism. And and let me just assure those of you who think that I am not certain um, of my faith in, in Christ. I'm so certain that I'm willing to say these things. So I'd like to share with you now an Orthodox prayer that calls upon the Holy Spirit to fill us with his divine presence and to lead us into this greater understanding of, of apocatastasis and theosis these larger things that Archbishop Ash was hinting at. So let's just pray. Shubho labo labado vadarucho kadisho in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O heavenly comforter, the Spirit of truth, who are everywhere and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Now, I would like to invite you to share a few moments of meditation with me so that we can move into any questions you may have for those watching this live. And if you're watching this later, you can still put your questions in the comments, or you can send them to me uh, by email at bishopavi at gmail.com. Now, if you're able, I want you to settle into a comfortable space if you're not already, inviting stillness into your body and to your mind. Gently close your eyes and take a deep cleansing breath. And as you exhale, release any tension, any thoughts that crowd your peace. Inhale deeply once more, envisioning a cascade of grace washing over you and restoring your spirit, restoring your spirit to its original state of purity. Exhale, feeling the weight of the world lift from your shoulders. Now with each breath, feel the rhythm of grace guiding you, moving you in harmony with this pulse of the divine and say to yourself, restored by grace, I join the divine dance with the creator and all creation. Restored by grace, I join the divine dance with the creator and all creation. Now imagine yourself in a vast open space the air is alive with the energy of life, vibrant and pulsating. With each breath, this energy grows, connecting you to both the earth below and the heavens, binding you to every living thing. Feel the grace that restores you, that heals, that renews. And with every inhale, you draw in this grace, and with every exhale, you radiate it out. 
and you repeat softly, restored by grace, I join the divine dance with the creator and all creation. See yourself joining a dance that is ancient and new, a dance where every step is an act of creation. Every movement is a melody of the cosmos. And you are not just a participant. You are a co-creator. Moving in sync by his grace with the creator and all creation. And as you dance, feel the barriers between you and the rest of creation dissolve. There is no separation, only unity, a harmonious flow of life, of energy, of love, restored by grace. I join the divine dance with the creator and all creation. And let this become a living reality for us. Now hold on to the sense of unity and grace. Restored by grace, I join the divine dance with the creator and all creation. Now as we close this part of our exploration, let the vision of universal restoration that Archbishop Ash championed be a beacon that guides us to a more expansive, more hopeful, and more engaged expression of our faith. Together, let's dare to hope, to dream, and to work for a better world that reflects the fullness of God's redemptive love for all creation. We did not go into any deep theology or his, even historical reflection of apocatastasis or universal reconciliation, how it relates to the um, Orthodox Church, the Church Fathers, Archbishop Ash. Um, to do so would take us quite a few sessions. But I will give you a sneak peek to something we're going to uh, look at next week. Um, as many of you know, Archbishop Veron Ash was uh, friends with Bishop Carlton Pearson, who has also recently uh, passed away. Uh, but there's been a lot of things happening since uh, both of these men of God have passed away. There are a lot more people seeking the very things that we've been talking about tonight. And a lot of people ask me, so what was the relationship between Veron Ash and Carlton Pearson? Well, we know that Archbishop Ash preached at Azusa conferences um, and that they certainly spoke to each other. Um, and in my conversations with uh, Bishop Pearson, um, you know, he shared even more things with me about some of the things that they talked about. And of course, I've always had Veron at my disposal in the past to talk to him about what they discussed. And some people want to get into more of the nitty gritty. So like, is apocatastasis the same thing as Carlton Pearson's gospel of inclusion, you know, which got him into all kinds of trouble um, with the modern evangelical church? And I will go deeper into that specific subject um, in the future broadcast. I think next week is the one that I'll, I'll, I'll be looking into that. And so if you're looking for a more in-depth uh, exploration of this, then I recommend that you come back you know, next week. Also, make sure you buy my book when it comes out. There's got to be more uh, uh, unveiling the prophetic preaching um, of Veron Ash, Archbishop Veron Ash. And of course, I'll go into it more detail there. Join us every Sunday at 4 p.m. Pacific time uh, for this show, All Things Reconciled. And if you haven't done so already, I need you to do three things right now. Like and subscribe this video and subscribe to the Proximity Portal channel. On Facebook, please like the Proximity Portal page and share it if you value what we're doing here, because this is only the beginning. And I'm in the process of restoring um, a lot of Bishop Ash's media, and we're going to make it available on this channel. So this is a huge project. And so I would greatly appreciate your help in getting this message out. Now, of course, we can also um, use your help financially as you're able. And we're not trying to profit from your giving. Rather, your gifts are going to go directly towards this process 
of restoring Bishop Ash's media and bringing it to a wider audience. And I'm sure that many of you agree that this is long past due. So please, if you're interested in learning more about the ministry of Archbishop Veron Ash and the Martoma Orthodox Church, you can send a private message to me, um, Bishop Avi Penhalo, or you can email me at bishopavi at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. I want to introduce um, my audience to uh, Father Jason McNair, who's also uh, called Abba Yaqub in our tradition. Um, Father Yaqub has been putting out some really quality, short, meditative um, reflections on the ancient faith. I posted um, one of them on the Proximity Portal earlier, and I really recommend you taking a look at that because all that I'm saying, um, he's he has a very he's skilled at putting those things and just packaging them in ways that are really really uh, engaging and 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 uh, you will benefit from it. So check out his page. Check out because um, he's all of us are part of this proximity portal. And again, the proximity portal is not just a church. It's not the Martoma Orthodox Church. We are going to have people on in future shows and broadcasts. Um, basically, we're breaking the channel down into different sections. So my section will be what you're watching now, the show like All, All Things uh, Reconciled. And then we'll also have um, um, Veron Ash's uh, media as as we clean it up. And, and when I say clean it up, I just mean you know some of these are really old. We're, we're finding this stuff wherever we can get it because unfortunately we do not have original copies of things. I don't see a whole lot of questions, but I, I saw one from Caleb that talks about many are called and few are chosen. And I think that, yep, that would be a, definitely a scripture that has to be wrestled with. So I am not trying to say that apocatastasis and theosis are easy um, to just like, you know, proof text out of scripture. Actually, what I'm saying is that in order to understand the scriptures, we do have to actually zoom out and 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 zoom in. Uh, we have to use different interpretive methods that are available to us. Some are better than others, of course. And, and um, one thing I would always recommend, especially for people of faith, is that there is something called canonical criticism. Canonical criticism, it means, simply means, that biblical interpretation, when it's done for the purposes of our Christian faith and and our and our Christian organizations should be done in in context of the church and in context with the history of the church. And I've mentioned in previous programs, you know, of course, a lot of people have this idea, myself included, when I was growing up, that the Bible was just dropped out of the sky, leather bound in King James Version. I mean, you know, we very rarely as a child, when, and I read the Bible a lot as a child, very rarely would I consider um, that, it, that this was an interpretation of an interpretation. And furthermore, and, and we'll circle back to this, but and it was interpretation of an interpretation. And on top of that, we have 2000 years difference between our lives today and back then. And so it's a very, what I've come to understand is that it's a very oversimplistic view um, to just believe that the Bible is the word of God, it's perfect, and in the sense that we can just read it and understand everything without taking into consideration context, language, history, and this thing that I'm talking about, which is canonical criticism, which basically in the Orthodox tradition, we call it holy tradition, meaning we take into consideration where these scriptures emerged and who was putting them together. And I always remind people, and forgive me for those of you who've heard this before, but I always remind people that the, the Bible, the early Christian, earliest Christians, the followers of Jesus and the direct disciples um, did not have a New Testament. They didn't. That didn't emerge till hundreds of years later. And so how was it that they maintained their faith? Well, they maintained it, and the scripture even talks about this, through the traditions of the apostles. And the closest thing we can get to that, of course, is reading the Bible. 
The next closest thing we can get to that is reading the the sub-apostolic fathers. That means those um, who were direct disciples of the disciples of Jesus, and we have some of their writings. Um, and But some of us have an aversion to reading those writings because we've been taught that those are like weird and, and they're not the Bible and, you know. But we're talking about writings that emerged simultaneously and right after the New Testament writings were released into the world. And so certainly the early Christians believed that when they were looking at the writings of, say, uh, Clement um, and uh, the Didache, these are all these, these texts that we have copies of now today. And so we have no excuse not to look at them, at least, even if we don't want to believe. Because often what we're trying to do is we're trying to align what we believe now and push it and put it into the mouths of the New Testament. And so, you know, we're, we're all susceptible to this sort of thing. So I'm not trying to uh, skirt anyone, um, any, any biblical exegesis here uh, because I am actually wanting to throw some other verses to, for us to consider. So, for example, let's look at this one. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, Through these he has given us every great and precious promise, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. That's when we were talking about theosis. Um, earlier I showed this one, that heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to apocatastasis. It's the only time actually that word appears in scripture. Um, but, but the concept is certainly there all throughout scripture. Um, to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Probably my favorite uh, verse uh, for, for apocatastasis is Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Um, throw a couple more out there. Uh, Timothy. Timothy says, you know, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And Peter says in 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, when all things are subjected to him, is speaking of Christ, or to the Father, I'm sorry, um, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under subjective under him. Why? that God may be all in all. It's interesting on a verse like this, how we will not take it literally, um, but it seems very, very clear. So we can. So my point here is that we can take verses that are very clear and then look at verses that are not very clear. Like for example, Jesus, um, when we're talking about, people talk about hell, they often bring up some of the parables of Jesus. Again, a parable, not even meaning to be a, a a literal story in the first place, and we'll take that and we'll you know go to town with it, but we won't we won't do the same with some of these verses that that um, state the same thing. Now I am not doing proper exegesis right now. Uh, we don't have time for that tonight, but that's actually where where we'll take this going forward. And then uh, here I'll leave you I'll leave you um, with another one. This is actually a little bit earlier in Corinthians. And just reminding us that when we're talking about all this stuff, we don't claim to like, you know, know every single aspect of what theosis looks like or apocatastasis look like. In fact, I'm relying heavily on the interpretive methods of the early Christians and the church fathers and, and not just on my own, like what I think about uh, this or that. And I remind myself with this verse all the time from 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, or through the glass darkly, if you're reading King James Version. But then, face to face. 
Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. That verse is just to, you know, always give myself and hopefully others, you know, a dose of humility of what we think we know. You know, some people get really excited about being great revelators or revelators. Um, and certainly uh, this verse would help a lot of people. I want to mention too, just for the Orthodox among us, that I am well aware that the uh, teachings of Origen, from whom one of the early church fa fathers whom much of this idea was ex uh, expounded from, and not just him, of course, St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, one of the main uh, Cappadocian fathers, they um, did not f always fully embrace apocatastasis the way that, that I've been describing it um, to you tonight. But I also want to make sure that you understand that it certainly wasn't a minority view either. And have a great week. Shubho, labo, labo rujo, kadisho. Amen. Grace and peace. Different dimensions pressing into the next level of what God has for you. Pressing into the next dimension that God has promised to his church. 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. We are settling for 30 fold.